I'm going to ask you all to just bow your heads with me as we give thanks to our Father before we begin. <laughs> Father, thank you so much that we can meet together today to fellowship and to worship you, to participate in the joys and the privileges of the kingdom you have made us a part of. I commit myself to you as always, Father, and pray that you will take charge of me and take charge of this meeting and bless us. For you are the only one who can bless. We can only be the instruments in your hand. Thank you, Father. I know you hear my prayer. And I appreciate the answer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Of course, today, I want to, to speak about... I want to continue speaking on the theme of the kingdom. Um, I think everybody in one way or the other has focused on the, the kingdom. And my own presentation, I looked at the thy kingdom come. And I want to continue to focus today on it a little bit. Maybe from a slightly different perspective. Now, I should have had the, the, the verses on the screen. But you all have your Bibles. Yeah. Right, I hope we will use them. For the, for the folks who are online... I'm going to bring up the, the, the verses on the screen. I didn't actually have the connection that I could use this, so I'm sorry I won't have it for those of us who are in the room face to face. But let me go ahead and um, share with our brothers and sisters online. So I want to start off with a question. I want, th th this, this morning, I want to entitle my presentation, The Bonds of the kingdom, the bonds of the kingdom. When I, I was thinking about this and my mind ran on some things that are current in the world today. I was talking to Brother Ken a couple of nights ago, it could have been last night, and I asked him this question, do you think Donald Trump will become president again? Now, I'm not asking him does he support Trump, but he said, yes, he thinks so. And um, I think that's interesting because everything looks negative from my perspective. But the last time when he told me that Trump would win, I said, no, no. And he was right. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not betting against him this time. But it's interesting to me. I, I give it some thought. And I know that even though we are not Americans, most of us here, the, the great majority of the world is interested in the U.S. elections and they are fixated on who will win. And most people are leaning to either the Democrats or the Republicans. Some people prefer Biden. They say, they say, they say Biden's policies are more humanist, human rights and he, the, 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 the Democrats are more concerned about this. Other people say Trump is the one who can make America great. Trump is the one who is concerned about security, and he's, he's more a person who will bring stability to the country. All kinds of arguments. And I have absolutely no opinion on the matter. You can trust me. So I'm not here mentioning it this morning because I have any opinion at all. I, I absolutely have nothing to do with politics in this world. Me, nothing. Politics is in my opinion, for those who are of the world. I fight for my kingdom. I vote for my kingdom and nobody else. But I, I'm, not, I'm not telling anybody what to do, but I'm just saying this is... So, so I'm thinking of Trump and Biden, and I think of all the supporters. These supporters are rabidly loyal. I mean, I, I thought... I know it's this way in Jamaican politics. I hear people in Jamaica say, me born PNP. My father was PNP and I will die PNP. Same thing labor right, okay? PNP color is orange, labor right color is green. You dare not go into a sea of green and wear an orange. You might even get beaten if you do it, right? People, people, I ask myself, why do people support these people? What are their motives? And I don't know if you ever think of it on a deep level. 
But if you think about it, I think I'm right when I say that everybody who supports Trump or Biden or Andrew Holness or Mark Golding or whoever in any political party, they are thinking about, there are several things that drive people, but mostly they are thinking about what can benefit them the most. Sometimes it's just that they, 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 uh, one leader is charismatic and they take on to the, uh, the, the, the idea of this person, his charisma, his, his appeal, his personality. But a lot of times it's just blind loyalty, but sometimes there are people who think this will, this will be more advantageous to the cause that I, I like. And so they, they, they have these blind... I, I think most political support is somewhat blinded in one way or the other. If there was real objectivity, I don't think you'd have some, this kind of, of balance. There's always some kind of bias there somewhere. But anyway, it made me think, why do kingdoms or governments become established and what makes them remain? You know, you can think of... They say the Roman Empire became one of the greatest empires in the world. Today they say that's America. But why? They give you all kinds of reasons. They say the Romans because they were, they were a disciplined military force. They were disciplined. They, 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 were, they were strict about obeying the rules of warfare. They had good generals and they fought and they became a strong military power. Rome, was eventually, Rome eventually lost that power. America today sits astride the world, but I think all of us believe that if time were to last, America would fall also. I wanted to ask a question, what is the basis of kingdoms? What makes kingdoms in this world rise and fall? What makes them stand? I want to read a couple of um, stories from the Bible to kind of su support what I'm going to say. Now, I'm going to read a story from a guy, about a guy named Abimelech. You know the name, but maybe you're not familiar with the person. This is a guy who, he was, he was what we would call a bastard. He was an outside child. You find the story in the book of Judges. His father, you might be surprised, the father of Abimelech was, anybody knows? His father was Gideon. 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 Gideon the hero. Gideon the man who overthrew the the Midianites with, with his bottle torches and his trumpets. Well, he had 71 sons. 71. And one of them was this Abimelech, and he was an outside child. So, when his father Gideon died, it says Abimelech in Judges 9, it says Abimelech, the son of Jeroboam, the other name for Gideon was Jeroboam. The son of Jeroboam went to Shechem unto his mother's brethren and communed with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, Speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, whether it is better for you either that all the sons of Jeroboam, which are three score and ten persons, seventy people, should rule over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. And his mother's brethren speak of him in the ears of all the men of Shechem, all these words. And their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, he is our brother. And so it goes on to say, you know what, you know what, Jer you know what Abimelech did? It says, he went unto his father's house at Ophrah, Gideon's house. And he slew his brethren, the sons of Jeroboam, being three score and ten persons upon one stone. He slaughtered his 70 brothers. Killed 70 of them, it says, upon one stone. Well, it looked like one escaped. Notwithstanding yet, Jotham, the youngest, of, the youngest son of Jeroboam, was left, for he hid himself. So apparently he killed 69. One got away. And all the men of Shechem gathered together, all the house of Milo, and they went and they made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. Now, you always heard that Saul was the first king of Israel. It's kind of wrong. It was Abimelech, right? Well, maybe he didn't rule over all Israel, but he ruled over a portion of Israel, right? Because 
he, he, Gideon delivered all of Israel. So whatever the influence of Gideon, it was widespread over most of Israel. So when he died, his 70 sons should have become judges over the land. But his brother, their brother killed them. And he was made king. Now it didn't end well for Abimelech because he went to make warfare against one, one town that wouldn't support him. And a woman dropped a stone on his head and killed him. Well, she didn't kill him. Because when, when the stone hit him in his head, he said to one of his men, come, strike me through with a sword. Don't let it be said that a woman killed me. So, so his friend killed him with a sword. So they couldn't say a woman killed him. Anyway, the crazy days of the judges. But the point I'm making as I look at this, and I'm asking myself, what made Abimelech want to be king? And what made the people make him king? What were the motives that drove these people to make this man king? It's, it's, it's what you call oligarchy. Is that the name for it? You know, I mean, oligarchy, I think, is the name that you give when you, you try to set up all your family in positions of influence and power because you have the, the, the place and you're going to use your influence. So, so because he was their brother, maybe on the mother's side, they agreed with him to make him king. It wasn't because he was qualified. It wasn't because he was qualified. I mean, does, does being a, a mass murderer qualify you to rule over people? As a matter of fact, if you use a sense, a man who will murder 70 men just so he can get into a position of power, he will murder you too. It's the most unsafe person that you can think of to rule over you. I, I think of this story, and I ask myself honestly whether it is much different today. One of the things I, 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 I observe from a distance, you know, some of my family members get really heated about it. Not those who are here, but some of my family members is politics. Oh my goodness, they get heated about um, the corruption in this party or the corruption in that party. And sometimes they expose these things. We have a family group on WhatsApp. When they expose these things, I myself am appalled. The, the corruption and the theft and the, the, the underhanded dealings that goes on in these political parties. And I, I say to them all the time, you're supporting these political leaders. Do you think they get into politics to help you? They, help, they are there to help themselves. Why do they fight and strive and put down people and fight people to remain in power? Why? It's themselves they are looking to benefit. And um, it, it, whenever you get into the, the undergrowth of what goes on among these politicians, you always see that the root reason is that they believe there's some benefit there for themselves. I mean, in, in the Jamaican parliament recently, some of you might have heard, but you know, the, gov the government said they didn't have enough money to give a raise to, to people. I think they gave the teachers what? Something like 2% or 1 point something percent, 2% 2 raise. They said they couldn't do better. 2% for the teachers over the course of what? Two years? Or three years? Something like that, right? Three years. 2% raise. One month later in parliament, they voted a raise for the parliamentarians, the people in the government, 300%. I didn't say 3%, 300%. And you know what? The opposing party went along with it. The opposing party went along to it. We the people were like helpless chickens. You could, you could fly high, fly low. You could raise your voice and make thunder. The two parties, the two parties in the country supported the move. Because everybody is getting the fight. Okay? And... Um, this, this, this was a, 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 I know that in some countries, they couldn't be so beer-faced with it, right? But in Jamaica, where our political system is still um, somewhat primitive, they do it openly. And nobody can do anything because our system, our political system is very primitive in a way. But anyway, the point I'm making is that in these kingdoms, the motives of the leaders and the rulers are always 
I think in almost every case. There's, there's one person I know that I, I, I might have some questions about. They said the, the, the president of Peru, he drives a little old VW. They say he gives away his salary. He doesn't take a salary from the country. The salary, he gives it away. He doesn't keep any of his salary. And he lives in a little cottage out in the, in the country. And he raises chickens and lives in a little poor house. He refuses to live in the place prepared for the president. He lives like an ordinary person. I don't know if he's still president, but he has been president for, was president for years when I read the story. And that might have been one rare person who really had the good of the people at heart. But in 99.9% .9 of the times, people go into politics. They seek for positions of power because they can advantage themselves. It doesn't matter if, it, if it's at the disadvantage of people. Now, you can look at many stories in the Bible like this. For example, Absalom. Anybody remember who was Absalom's father? David. King David, right? Absalom sat at the gate of the city and he told the people, if I was king, things would be better for you. Right? He said, um, what, somebody, somebody owe you money? They take away your land? You mean the king does nothing to help you? Come on, if I were king. He, 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 the Bible says he, he, he took away the hearts of the people. The stupid people, like most people today, believe that this politician meant them good. Now, as it always is, well, Absalom's story didn't end up so good for him, but I'm going to go to another story in the Bible where God said something and I wanted to read. This is where the people of Israel asked God to give them a king, okay? Sometimes you look at something, you know, they say, you, you have heard the saying that the grass looks greener on the other side of the fence because it's planted over the sewage pit, right? Because the sewage pit is underneath. That's why it looks greener. But most people only look and they see the green grass and they don't examine to see what is feeding this green grass. <laughs> um, so the people saw that everybody had a king. Everybody had, a, was, had somebody ruling over them. And they thought, because they have a king, their, their, their system is more disciplined and they have a greater chance of victory over their enemies. They never could understand the, the nuts and bolts and the machinery and why, the, why things work the way they work. They never understood this. And that's the, the short-sightedness of humanity. That's why we always need to listen to God's advice, regardless of whether we can see through it. But God told the people something. Look at what he said. Now, was God just being spiteful to the Israelites when he said this? Or is this a universal principle? Listen to what he said. He said, this shall be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. First Samuel 8, I'm reading from verse 11. This is the kind of king that will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. What he's saying is going to take advantage of you for his benefit. To, to, to glorify himself, he's going to use you. You're going to become a tool to exalt this person. Was it just Saul or was it just a principle of life that this is the way when you appoint human rulers? I don't think God was just simply saying, I'm going to choose your body ruler. No. God understands human nature and the human heart. And when you put people in certain positions, inevitably... You know the saying, power corrupts. And what? Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. We have to be very careful, especially when we find ourselves in a place of influence. We have to be, this is why God chooses the people that he uses very carefully. Because it is so easy to become exalted and lifted up in your own eyes. Look at what happened to Saul. Even David, the man after God's heart. Look at what he did with Uriah. You think if David was a shepherd in, 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 in mining sheep, he would have had the opportunity or the inclination to do what he did with Uriah. But when you are king and every woman is looking for you, looking after you, looking you, seeking you, as we say in Jamaica, looking you. You are king. You have all the power at your fingertips. You are the... the, the the dream of every woman. Solomon ended up with 700. 
It says, and he will appoint him captains over thousands, captains over fifties, and will set them to ear his ground, to plant his ground, to reap his harvest, to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries, to make sweetie, and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. He's going to tax the life out of you. Don't you worry when you see yourself heavily taxed. He will take your maids, men servant, your, your, your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep and you shall be his servants. And God says, and you shall cry out in that day because of your king which you shall have chosen you. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. God is not vindictive, but God says, I'm going to give you what you want. You get what you want. Why are you crying? So anyway, the point I wanted to make why I read this, I wanted to, to make the point that this is a principle of life that God is outlining here. Let's not misread it. Let's not think that God was saying, I'm going to give you King Saul, and this is how Saul is going to be. But if, if I had given you somebody else, like Solomon, or, or, or Jeroboam or whoever, it would have been different. No, this is a principle of life that God is saying. This is why I never gave you a king because I didn't want you to have this kind of life. They say Solomon was the greatest king. The glory of Solomon's kingdom went all over the world. You know what, you know what happened when Solomon died? You know what the people said? They said to his son Rehoboam, tell us what you're going to do because our father, your father taxed the life out of us. Your father oppressed us. Great Solomon! oppressed the people and his stupid son said look here my father beat you with whips I'm going to beat you with scorpions the stupidity and the arrogance that comes upon you when you are in a position of power sometimes you overdo it you, you go too far that's what happened to Solomon's son now maybe the best way that I can express it is in a parable that was told you remember the one son of, of Gideon that escaped? Remember the one son? They killed 69 and one, 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 one hid himself. His name was Jotham. So when, when this bastard son, Abimelech, made himself king, Jotham ran up in a hilltop far away and he shouted at them. And I want to tell you what Jotham said. This is probably a good expression of the motives and the desires that make people seek to rule over others. It said, he said, he told them a parable. He lifted up his voice and he cried and he said unto them, Listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may hearken to you. I'm reading Judges chapter 9 from verse, eight, uh, verse 7. Here's his story. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. Olive tree. Useful tree, right? What does it do all the time? It bears olives. Olive oil is supposed to be one of the best oils in the world, right? It's busy doing something. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness, wherewith by me they honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? Too busy doing good to rule over, over the trees. The tree said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. <clears throat> Another nice tree. We don't have much figs in Jamaica, but I enjoy the fruit when I can get it. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine which cheereth God and man and go to be promoted over the trees the vine the olive tree the fig tree useful and good they don't have time to go into politics then said all the trees unto the bramble <laughs> what we call it bramble in Jamaica makabush makabush and to 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 in anglicize it, it's a thorn bush. Come thou 
and reign over us. This is the one that is doing nothing but humbugging people. And this one says, the bramble said unto the trees, if in truth you anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. You ever going to the shadow of a prickle bush, of a maca bush? Okay, if you're going there, anywhere you turn, you get juke. Right? And if not, if you won't come and put your trust in my shadow, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Here you hear the voice of a dragon. Right? The, the, the one that is doing no good in the world is the one who wants to rule. And his rule is of such a nature that you must come and completely commit yourself to him. And if you don't, he will destroy you. This guy was wise. Maybe that's why he escaped. Right? While the other 69 got killed. But he was very wise. He shows, this parable shows a great insight into the nature of human rulership. Whether they call it democracy, or communism. All governments are there to remain in power. You know, sometimes I, I listen to some of the conspiracy theories and they will say, they do this and, they, and I wonder, who are they? But everybody is aware that in the background, there are some people who are demanding control. They, and they, they want to have it at any cost. They want to have it at any cost. And whether they manipulate governments or they themselves, the governments are the manipulators, everybody is aware that something is going on and there's somebody pulling the strings and these people are interested in obtaining and keeping power at any cost. It doesn't matter how many people die. That was hard for me to believe. I, I couldn't believe that people would be, would cold-bloodedly kill people for no reason but to maintain your place of power. It's hard for me to believe because that is so far into my nature. But I'm a Christian. And when people are not Christians, they, are, they behave just like this bramble. So, Jotham, this boy who escaped, he shows us that the motives of the average king, the human king, he's looking for self-glory. He wants attention to be on himself and he wants to be elevated above everybody else. Everybody must must it, when you hear that Darius was happy to make a decree that nobody should pray to any god but to him for 30 days that sounds like lunacy why would any, any intelligent man agree for people to pray to him for 30 days what can he give anybody but what it does it massages the ego of the person and makes him feel that he is somebody great. And this is exactly what the men who came to him, they were playing upon this attribute of humanity, this desire, this idea that I am so important that my people come to me to make all these requests. They played him. They played him. But um, it, it's, because we have this, it's because these people, I, I suppose we all have it to some extent, but these people have it in a massive degree. This ego hunting. They are looking for self-glory. They are looking for dominance. They are looking for power. They are looking for fame. And they are looking to leave a name behind. I have to admit, inside of me there is a desire to do something useful. I remember when I became a Christian. One of the reasons why I became a Christian, I say all the time, was because I didn't know what I was doing with my life. Most young people, by the time you leave school, you know you're going to be going into teaching or into nursing or into the police force or, or become a doctor, lawyer, something. Most young people have a plan from their small. I had no plan. I just drifted through high school. When I was finished, I drifted into a job. And I was drifting in life and I was going nowhere and I thought, I need some purpose. And that's one of the reasons, one of the things that made me become a Christian because... I needed help with my life. But one of the things that was in my mind when I, I thought, I don't have a desire to become a politician. I don't have a desire to become a public figure. I don't have a desire to be seen 
And yet I wanted to leave a mark on life. I wanted to know that when my life is lived and it comes to an end, I can know that I had lived for a good reason and I accomplished something worthwhile in this life. And when I look around me, my best friend in school, he was at the university and um, he was studying to be a doctor, my best friend. When he left high school, he got, he got seven distinctions and one credit. In those days, we did General Certificate, Certificate of Education, GCE. Harder than the 60, what they're doing now. He got seven distinctions and one credit. Right. I passed four subjects. When he was studying, I was ramping. Well, to be honest, I had disadvantages. <laughs> I lived 26 miles away from school. Sometimes I got home in the night. One morning I got home at 3 o'clock in the morning. Because we have to boom drive every day because my parents didn't have the fee. We boom drive to school, we boom drive back. Sometimes we don't get any drive in the morning. We go beach. Me and Dan go beach. We spend the day at the beach. That's how my school days were. And I was, I was waiting for school to be over. I just hated school. And so I was drifting through life. But when I became a Christian, I thought, you know, here are my friends and they are making their way in life. You know? And, and what can I do and what can I be? And, and you know what the Lord settled in my mind? This is what he gave me when I became a Christian. You can become. You can become a tool in the hand of God and he will make you something that is as valuable as eternity. That was the ambition I got. That's what, that's what the Lord put in my mind. My name will never be on the TV. It will never be on the front of the newspapers. But I want to know, I, 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 got, I got the balance of life. I got the balance and I saw what life was about. I saw that this world is just a puff of wind. But there's something eternal and there's something greater. And if I can latch into line with eternity, I might find a way that my life can mean something. That's, that's the dream that I got at the beginning when I became a Christian. That's a dream. and I, I, it, 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 That was my, my legacy. That was the legacy I was after. And I realize that everybody has this kind of thing, this kind of desire. And those of us who are able to make, to touch the Lord. We're able to step into the stream of eternity and to find something that is really worthwhile. Other people seek it here. And if I were seeking it here, if I were seeking it here, I would be one of the rich men because I wasn't going to stop till I'd made it. If, 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 if ambition and desire is focused on this world, be the best. Right? When I used to go to school, they used to say, they used to say, they used to take us into, into the assembly in the mornings. And even when I used to teach, they put, us, they put the children in the assembly and they say, you could be the next prime minister. Right? Probably they say it in every school in the, in the country. You could be the next prime minister. They're trying to tell you to strive to be better, get your lessons right. You could be the next prime minister. I'm always thinking, that's the last thing in the world I want to be. I have no desire to be in control of other people and rule over them. But it drives and it turns on some people. So, the motives of rulers in this world are something to think about. And it made me think of what is Jesus' motive for rulership? It's interesting because remember, there's only one body. I like this song because it, 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 it's, it's, it's something that has settled in my heart. That the, the kingdom of God, it means, uh, my, my understanding of this has grown. The kingdom of God, I realize that God is building his kingdom and we are a part of this kingdom that is being built and this kingdom is to overthrow Satan's kingdom. But on what principle? On what basis? There's some element in our kingdom that is the key to overthrowing these other kingdoms. There's some element. And I want us to get it right. This element is not force. When Christ set up the kingdom 2,000 years ago, was it that we become a dominant military power to overthrow America and overthrow Russia and overthrow China? Was that what God was after? There are Christians today, most notably in America. None of these Americans here. But there are Christians in America today who believe that that is the mission of the kingdom of Christ. We are to... They believe the kingdom of Christ is to dominate politics and to take over politics 
and use the military power of the country to establish Christianity. They are some of the most dangerous people in the world. But Christ did not set up the kingdom on the basis of military power. But there is a principle that he put in the kingdom. This is to be the hallmark. This is to be the bond that binds his kingdom together. And that is what we want to understand so that we can get our eyes on what is really important. John 13 and verse 1. This is our king. This is our king. This is the one who is not a bramble. This is the true king who is displaying the true motives and the ways of his kingdom. It says in John 13 and verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Any of you followers of Biden or Trump, can you say that? Can you say that Trump or Biden loves you and loves you unto the end? There's a principle in the kingdom of Christ that you find nowhere else. There's a reason why one king is qualified to rule forever. And we begin to get a pattern, uh, we, get, we begin, begin to get an idea of why. In this simple sentence, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. There's a reason why only one king can rule forever. Take any of the rulers in this world, they, 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 they have some dominance and power. I mean, Putin is a strong man. I mean, the, the, the ruler of China is a strong man. The one in North Korea, they are strong people. But look here, you're hardly going to find even one of the citizens that say they love these people. Or to say that these people love them. Hardly one of the citizens. Anyone who will say they love them is probably a family member. Right? Trump has great supporters. But they, 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 they love the potential of what he might do to advantage the country or advantage them. Not because they love him personally. A lot of them will admit that Trump has low morals. They don't have any personal affection for him. But they see where he can be beneficial. He can be of advantage to them. Biden is saying, I don't want to start talking because I'm going to get into political arguments which I, I don't absolutely don't want to be involved in. But here is a principle of our king. Having loved his own, he loved them unto the end. There's a reason why God never, well, here's another reason why God never just established the kingdom way back there 2,000 years ago. Joan is here. Praise the Lord. She went back out. Good to see you, Joan. Um, there's a reason. Before before Jesus sets up his kingdom, you know what he does first? He shows you the principle that, that he builds on. He shows you who he is. Jesus doesn't establish himself as king. He does nothing to set up his kingdom before we see the nature of the king. Because otherwise, we'd be in a position where we might doubt the king. We might not trust the king. We might be following the king because, look, he has the power to set up his kingdom. But before he did that, he did everything. God's ways are so wise. He did everything to make us know what kind of person is this king. I guess it's a principle, you know, in the Bible. Before honor is what? Before honor is humility. Before honor is humility. That's a principle there. And God operates on that in that way. In John 15 and verse 5, look at what else he says. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. You GLP and you, and you PNP and you Democrats and you Republicans, tell me, which of your leaders can tell you without me you can do nothing? Unless he's standing over you with a whip. Then he'll tell you, don't move until I tell you to move. That's the only way he can say, without me, you can do nothing. There is one king, he's operating on a principle. There are, there are elements in his kingship that are unique. 
There's something that makes him the only potential, the only, the only possible candidate in a kingdom that is going to last forever. So, first of all, we see his love. He loves his people unto the end. Secondly, he enables his people. Without me, you can do nothing. Jesus is not wanting to rule because he has ambitions for himself. You see what I'm saying? It's not because he's trying to dominate and to rule. Many people have the idea that God, God is going to rule people with a rod of iron. Why? Because God is an egotist and God wants to be exalted. And if you don't glorify me, I will smite you. Like Jeroboam. Like Abimelech. Like Absalom, they think of God in these terms and because you have this unworthy idea of God, you are, before him, you are before him like a slave, striving to do what you think will please him, but afraid. That's not the principle of our kingdom. You see the song that we sang? Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. It's not chains. It's not military force. It's not police and soldiers. There are some cords that cannot be broken. And we pray, bind us together, Lord, with these cords that cannot be broken. This is what is worthwhile, not only in this world, but in any world that exists. To be a part of the kingdom, brothers and sisters, is a great and wonderful privilege. Don't let anybody or anything induce you to step out of it for one moment. And if you are not yet a part of this kingdom, by the grace of God, step into the kingdom. I know we're going to, we, 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 have, we potentially have, we have a baptism tomorrow. Potentially there will be two people who will be baptized. We will see. But um, it's wonderful that you are stepping into the kingdom. Praise the Lord. Another verse is Philippians 1 and verse 11. It says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Who? You and me. Who? The citizens of the kingdom, filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. That's where the fruits of righteousness comes from, from Jesus Christ. So, the point I'm really emphasizing here is that the motives of our king are absolutely pure. The only reason why Jesus wants to rule in your life is because you can't do anything without him. And because he loves you. And because you cannot be righteous without him. There's no motive there similar to the motives of those who rule in this world. In case you never understood why it is that this kingdom is to last forever. These verses should make it clear to us. Why do we serve him? Now, I'm going to go to another question. Why? Because I know that we all desire to see a more vibrant, living church. All right? That has been my quest for many years. As I've grown older, as my understanding has improved, it's been modified a little bit. Not that I no longer desire this, but I'm seeking for it in a different way. And I'm going to show you why. Look at John 14 and verse 13. Actually, 15 is what I want. <clears throat> John 14 and verse 15. Look at what Jesus said. If you love me, keep my commandments. Why should you keep his commandments? Why? If you love him. Okay, he has introduced the same element, the same element that makes him qualified to be king. He introduces it as the same element that qualifies you to be a citizen. Same element. He is king over us, and we accept that kingship by loving him in return. Look here. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 5, the love of Christ constrain it. What does the word constrain mean? It's almost compelled. It's almost compelled. It's not quite as compelled. It's like you're going along a pathway and somebody pulls you over to this side and says, this is how you must walk. And every time you try to walk, they, they push you back into the pathway. Constraint is almost like compel. Listen to what the Bible says. It says the love of Christ is what compels us to do the things that we do as Christians. That is what con constrains us. Look here. 
If you are working with an earthly organization, you know what they do? When you don't do your job, they write a letter and put it on your file. Okay? That's a warning. Do it again and you're going to lose your job, right? That's how they constrain you. They, they compel and force you with threats. Or sometimes they, they might reward you, promise you to raise your pay if you do better. I was always... I was, I was made for those systems. When I was a teacher, I prayed every day to get out of it. Chris knows what I'm talking about. Daniel knows. Those who have been teachers, you know, right? Every, 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 every week you have to write these long lesson plans. When you don't write it, the principal comes and makes a note and he, 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 he watches every Monday morning you hand in your lesson plan and he will tell you where... You are, you are under constant pressure to perform. And there is a subtle threat hanging over your head. I worked at one place, and, you know, I was supposed to be in charge of cultural activities. And they, they put me in charge of writing a newsletter. A magazine for, for the, 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 the institution. So I put one together. And the, center, the, the manager of the place said, no, it, 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 it got, because I, I, there was some humor in it, right? He said, no, he didn't like that. I'm to take out the humor and I'm to... I said, you know, you asked me to write this. I've written it according to my ability. If I can't write it the way I, 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 I should write it, and you want it to be written that way, you should write it or ask somebody else to do it. And um, this was actually in a staff meeting, so he said, um, all right, Mr. Clayton, but I want you to know that you're the person who is responsible for this. You know what I said to him? <laughs> I shouldn't have said it, but I was young. I said, I said that sounds like blackmail. <laughs> and the other staff members laugh. But it's like when you work in a place and your motives are for your salary, you're under pressure. They threaten you. If you don't conform, if you don't do what they tell you to do, there's a constant danger hanging over your head. In our kingdom, our king says there's a motive on both sides. He loves us and he loves us unto death. And why do we keep his commandments? Because we love him. What is it that makes us do what he wants to do? We love him. This is the glue that binds us together in this kingdom. And the more I understand it, the more I realize why the love among brethren is so important important to God. It's, it's, it's a glue that binds the universe together. When the Bible says, he that loveth not, knoweth not God. For God is love. Everything in the kingdom of God is centered around love. Ken talked about the 144,000. Probably all of us talked about the 144,000. But I'll tell you something. When the 144,000 is finally perfect, they will be perfected in love. I don't know if they're all going to eat the same kind of food. I doubt it. Right? I don't know if all of them are going to have their dresses at the same length. I doubt it. Right? I don't know if all of them are going to understand every detail of morality exactly alike. Probably not. But I'll tell you something. All of them will reflect the love of Christ in their lives. It will show among them. Isn't that what Jesus says? The mark of the one for the four thousand. What does he say? By this Shall all men, isn't that the world? Isn't that the witness to the world? All men shall know you are my disciples because you have love one for another. I admit that I still don't understand the full beauty of what that looks like. Okay? Some of us, like me, we're not naturally, we're not naturally effusive and overflowing. Right? Yeah, because I pull it out of me sometimes. Because of my nature. But I'm trying to do better. Uh, 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 be, be, because I realize my Lord wants me to love people like how I love my wife. Like how I love my children. Like how I love my grandchildren. And to treat them accordingly. Unconditionally. Regardless of how... Regardless of their faults. Everybody in here has faults. I can look at every one of you... And I can name your faults, and I'm sure every one of you can look at me and tell me the things that are not so pleasing. But in spite of this, in spite of this, if the love of Christ is in our hearts, we love each other. And because we love each other, 
He says, greater love that no man than, greater love has no man than this advice. A man lay down his life for his friends. And he not only said it, but he gave us the example by doing it himself. He laid down his life for us. You know, it's so many places in Jesus' statement, sometimes I wonder, how can we, overcome, we, we overlook this? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. Why do we keep his words? Right? Not because you hold up ten rules in front of me. Not because you keep beating me with a set of thou shots. Why do I do? Why do I keep his word? Because I love him. If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him. And here is the beautiful promise. We will come unto him and make our home with him. This is, this is the greatest ambition I have in life. Right. I want this promise. I, 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 have, I have experienced it. But I want more. Okay, I want more. I want, I want the 100% 24-7 sense of the presence of the Father and His Son that my life becomes what Ken was dwelling on this morning, a representation, a, 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 a mirror image of the life of Christ. That's what I would like, honestly. It's a mountain, but it's a mountain I want to climb. There are two things that are the insignia of the, the kingdom. Number one is love. And the other one is, let me look at Galatians 5 and verse 6. Here it is. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. But what? Faith, which worketh by what? Love. Okay, I don't want us to forget. More and more I realize that in the, in, in, in the New Testament, these are the two things that stand out. Faith and love. Faith and love. Why? Because you can talk about love. But if we don't really believe in the love of Christ, it's just a word that we use. It's when we, it's when we truly believe in the Lord that the love of the Lord can appear in our lives. Because, you know, it says, we love him what? First John 4 and verse 11. We love him because he first loved us. Do you believe that? I mean, how do you know that he loved you first? The Bible says that he went to death for you, having loved his own that were in the world. He loved them unto the death. Do you believe that the Son of God died so you can live? Do you believe he lives in heaven today and his main occupation is your salvation and the vindication of the kingdom that we belong to? Do you believe that this is what Jesus is involved in? And if we believe, the consequence is that we ourselves become absorbed in the same mission. Same mission. So, so what I really want to say today is that we have the same goals. And we should understand how to achieve those goals the right way. Every Christian in the world desires to serve the Lord. There's a mission in Florida. I don't really think too highly of them, but their motto is saved to serve. You might have an idea who I'm talking about. But having, having watched some of their presentations, they, they are pushing it. They are pushing you. We are safe to serve. You are safe to become an instrument to do, to do this and to do that. And they are pushing you. I don't think that is the way that the Lord operates. The Lord operates on this great principle of love. What the Lord does is he breaks your heart with the revelation of his love. He breaks your heart with the revelation of his love. And I, I read a statement many years ago. I don't remember who said it. But you know, this statement has stuck in my mind. It says simply this. This is the ambition that this person expressed. May my heart break with the things that break the heart of God. May my heart break with the things that break the heart of God. That is the motive that God wants us to move from. The love of Christ constraineth us. And so, brothers and sisters, if, if we find that in our lives, if we find in our lives 
that your zeal for the Lord is not what it should be. Sometimes you get to that place, okay? When Jesus wrote to the Ephesus church, let me just go to that as maybe the last verse that I'll use today. When you go to Revelation chapter 2, and Jesus speaks to the Ephesus church, one of those churches in Revelation that he has a lot of good to say about this church. But look at what he says in verse 4. He says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Jesus criticizes his people for not loving him enough. He even says that these people, they are a working church. But then he says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works. The first works of love, the things that you do when you love a person. Go back to that love. And when that love is there, the, the, the actions will follow. If I could use a, a, a human relationship, okay? Most of us, every, everybody, I don't want to use any examples here today, and I won't, but I can use myself as an example. I know that when I was in my teen years and I was attracted to my present wife, I mean, there were times when I was attracted to somebody else before I met her, but when I became attracted to her, it was decency and the influence of our grandmother that made me leave the yard at night. <laughs> because if I follow my heart, I would stay there till morning. Right? Because when I, I, I come home from work and I go around there, I don't want to leave any excuse to stay. Right? And I would, I would, I would, I would help to wash the clothes, wash the dishes, do anything, help to fix up our hair, whatever she needed to be done. Things that today sometimes I'm a little too busy. And I know that almost every wife will say, I wish there was still that first love. Right. The reason why, maybe it's not that you don't love enough, but maybe you don't have that first love. Because the first love is a kind of obsession where you can't take your mind out of that person. And, and, and the, Lord, the Lord is saying to us that, I, I'm telling you, you, you look at somebody like, um, you hear Donovan talking, and he seems almost like a, 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 the energizer bunny. Because he just is so hype and full of energy, and he always wants to, he's, he's always focused on doing something relating to the Lord. And, um, He's, he's, in the, he's in the glow of first love, fresh young love. And you have, seen, you have seen newborn Christians and they are like that. And that is the way we ought to be because when, when you're in this condition, nobody has to tell you to do anything. Nobody has to tell you to do anything, right? I mean, I don't want to put Donovan on this part, but I mean, I've encountered people like this, but he's almost embarrassing, right? I come... And I go to the bus to take out the gas cylinder. No, no, I'll do that. He takes it from me. I feel like an old man. But, <laughs> but, but I know he just wants to show the love of Christ. So I let him go with it. And you, you have seen people like this. You don't have to drive or push them. You don't have to tell them. They want to always come in to collect trucks or finding somebody that they can go and help. Because the love of Christ is fresh in them. And this first love drives them. This is a proper motivation for Christianity, and that's why the Lord says, it's faith that works by love that is important. It's the glue that binds our kingdom together, and our, our, our king will operate on no other basis. This is why he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. This is why when Peter betrayed him, denied him, Almost the same as betrayal. When Peter denied him, the morning he meets them on the seaside, he says to Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these fish that you're catching? Three times he asked them. The question is three times, do you love me? Because that is the bottom line. Yeah. Kaylee, you're going to be baptized. If it's only because you want to be a part of a church, it's a wrong motive. I know you know that. But I'm telling you anyway. I'm saying it because you're a good example. <laughs> but you know if it's because you have learned to love the Lord 
and you want your life to belong to him. And you want him to use you and to serve you. Sweetheart, you are taking the right step. And may all those of us who are in the second or third love remember that what God wants, what God is after, for me too, what he's after is for me to do what it takes to return to that first love. You know, they say if your love is growing cold, Sister Carleen, or your husband's love is growing cold, I'm not suggesting it is. It's just a nice example of sitting at the front. What, you, what, what he needs to do and what you need to do is do the things you used to do before. I know my wife is listening, so I better watch what I say. <laughs> but, you know, things we don't do that we used to do, we used to just go for a walk sometimes in the moonlight. We used to go places together for no reason but just to be together. <clears throat> Nowadays it seems like we are so busy. But it's just because your mind has adjusted. It's not because you are too busy. And I'm saying the same thing for the Lord. Same thing for the Lord. When you became a Christian, you were obsessed with his word. You were obsessed with prayer. Everywhere I went, my Bible was under my arm. Whether I was going to work or to the bank, everywhere I went, my Bible was under my arm. Anybody who saw me, they knew what I was about because the Bible was under my arm. Every time I went to the bank and I got in a line, I was reading the, bank, the Bible. I was in the bus, I was reading the Bible. Nobody ever had to ask a question. My flag was up high. And I wasn't doing it because it was a chore. It was because I just wanted to be connected to the Lord in any way possible. The Lord is saying to us, brothers and sisters, that you know, as we, as we contemplate the kingdom and as we see the time approaching for our kingdom to be put on display before the world, because that's the bottom line in our time. Our kingdom is to be put on display before the world. Let all of us take this word to heart today. Let us seek to do whatever it takes to find or return to that first love because this is the bond that holds the kingdom of Christ together. I'm going to stop here today with a hope and a prayer in my heart that you have been able to understand the point I've been trying to make. God bless you and may he continue to keep us as we continue to worship.